Hello and welcome to The Reset, a mental health podcast without all the bollocks. I'm Sam Delaney. My guest this week is the counsellor Jordan Patterson, who helps run the family programme at rehab centre The Cabin in Thailand. For every addict in recovery, there's a whole group of loved ones who are usually suffering in some way in the background. I know from my own period on the booze and gear, it was just as tough, if not tougher, for my wife to cope with it as it was for me. Often these people are the patient heroes who help save the addict's life. And yet, their pain isn't always recognised or treated. That's why programmes like Jordan's are so important. Having grown up with an alcoholic as a father, Jordan knows firsthand the trauma that clients are experiencing. I was really pleased he was willing to come onto the reset and tell his often painful story with such honesty and insight. And I hope you enjoy listening to our chat. Jordan, welcome to the reset. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I've always wanted to speak to someone on the reset who can give us some perspective and insight and advice for the many people who live with an addict in their family. Um, it's a story that we don't tell enough, I think. You know, certainly on this podcast, I've spoken to a, a great many addicts and people also who treat addiction. And we look at it entirely from that perspective. But, of course, anyone with an addiction, there is a ripple effect on so many others all around them in their lives. And uh, those people, their stories don't often get as much attention. Now, I know that you work with families and loved ones of addicts a great deal, and we're going to talk about that. Um, But what I want to talk about first, Jordan, is your own childhood, because, of course, your insight comes from personal experience of having a father who's an addict. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah, so, uh, he, uh, so growing up, um, I was very close with my dad. Um, he was very, um, affectionate and he had a lot of time for me. Um, very present. I felt very sort of loved by him. Mm. Um, and sort of like he was the stay-at-home dad. Uh, he worked from home and my mum went off and sort of worked away. So I was very, very close with him. He was my primary caregiver. Right. Um, and then sort of as time went on, like I remembered this one moment that sort of sticks most, you know, sticks very strongly in my head. I, I went down to the garage to get something and – lights were off and I turned the light on and he was just sort of sculling this kind of wine in the garage like mm. alone. So um that I don't know I don't know why that sticks with me. Uh but I remember feeling very uneasy at the time, even as like a six year old. Wow. Um and then over time you would find that like there would be wine that's just kind of left all over the house at, at different points and then he would start picking me up and he would be clearly drunk from school. Um, And so that was obviously causing a lot of problems in my uh, parents' marriage. And then, um, you know, he got a, I remember him being brought home really drunk uh, sort of by the police because he was caught drunk in charge of a vehicle. Um, And, you know, my mum sort of screaming and hitting him. Um, And, you know, probably another one of the most sort of traumatic things that I witnessed as a kid was um, when came home from a, a holiday with my mum and my dad was supposed to pick me up from the airport. And then, uh, you know, so we made our way home on our own, didn't know where he was, couldn't contact him. And then he arrived home and he said, I tried to kill myself and that was like, I think I was about eight. Um, And so very, very traumatic that that obviously that was. Um, And then sort of when they, uh, their marriage kind of dissolved, um, I remember, again, I I got a lot of these strong memories of, I remember him walking down the driveway with the last of his stuff when he was moving out of the house Um, and just, felt horrible um and then it's kind of once uh he was living on his own and i was an only child um that was one of the hardest things for me was that 
Um, when I went to visit him over the weekend, you would never know if he was drunk or whether he was going to be sober. And I was, you know, hoping so much that he would be sober, but there was a pretty large portion of the time that he'd be too drunk. I would then have to go home and just sort of be with my mum that I wasn't really particularly close to. So that was a very sort of, that had a really bad effect on me because I then actually uh, sort of trained myself to to not expect good things anymore. I had to expect that he was going to be drunk to ease mm. the pain. Mm. Um, and then by the end, it didn't matter if he was drunk or sober because I was just kind of not really present anymore. I was just kind of always on edge. Um, and then it was like I felt like I had to parent him because he had depression and addiction. So, like, and he had no friends. He didn't. He was unable to uh, keep a job. He never got another partner. So I felt like I was the only person in his world and the only person that really like tried to help him. But everything that I tried uh, just didn't work at all. And you know, another thing is just I remember a year or two before he passed away. Um, just sort of casually referencing the fact that he was an alcoholic. And he said, uh, oh, I'm not an alcoholic. It was like, wow. So so <laughs> even after all the years and all the things that we've gone through, like he still had that denial. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit about my story anyway. Wow. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. It must be painful to, to speak about it. Um, but... When you're so young and those things become apparent to you, I mean, how apparent are they? How much understanding do you remember having of things such as alcoholism? Like, you know, when you're as young as six or, you know, when you're eight years old, your dad's saying, presumably the impression I get is he said very openly in front of you that he tried to kill himself. I mean, yeah. does that seem real? Do you understand at that age just how serious these things are? Um, I think that there's, I think as a kid, you, you're very tuned into what's going on, uh, in terms of your feelings. So I felt very uneasy. I felt very upset, felt very scared. Um, but you don't have the rational, uh, things to actually make it make sense. And so you just sort of holding the, these feelings and you don't really know what to do with them. And at the time, my mum, I remember after that incident, she just said, look, just be nice to your dad or something. Um, and, yeah, so that was obviously not a time that she was going to go into things in great detail. Um, but I do think that <clears throat> as I got a bit older and my mum felt like I, I was able to take on more of the information she was much more um it was it was fairly free flow of um what addiction is and what she thought about my dad's addiction and the fact that this isn't something that he's choosing to do this is a disease that he has you know so i i really give credit to my mum for being able to sort of when the time came um give me the the details that i needed to to reduce the shame I think that was probably the biggest thing. Um, I did still develop a, a caretaking complex where I felt like the only way that I could sort of have, I could be useful was to to, to kind of look after people. Um, so I definitely still developed that. But I think um, I did have less shame as a result of her <clears throat> supporting me. And I think that, enabled me to set boundaries because, you know, I understood that, like, this person is not going to stop. It doesn't matter what I do, he's not going to stop. So, you know, unless he chooses to do it himself. So, therefore, um, I have to do what I need to do to set boundaries. And, and and you know, I am I, – I, I deserve to set boundaries. I, I – you know, like it's okay that I want to um, not see him when he's really drunk. 
Um, so I think that instilled a bit of self-worth, I think, that was important to, to set boundaries at quite a young age. Mm. Yeah, that sounds extremely sort of enlightened uh, of your mum because mm. I'm assuming, and, and you deal with, with um, a lot of people like this, I'm sure, like, you know, with kids in particular, you will tr- a lot of families, understandably, will think, we need to keep this secret. We need to keep it hidden. And like you say, yeah. it's very hard to hide things like that from children. Children are very tuned in. And I, I, I yeah. would assume that that only increases feelings of fear and shame if it feels like a dirty secret that's not discussed or understood. Um, yeah. So I think that's incredible from your mum because it takes a huge amount of understanding. And a lot of people mm. who experience like an, an addict in their sort of family, they're not they're not trained for that and they've never experienced it before. I don't know whether your mum had experience in that, but if, yeah. if, if you don't, well, that, <laughs> that, that's quite telling because I, I guess like, however compassionate you are or understand you are as a person, addiction is such a difficult mm. thing to, to relate to and understand, even if it's a, a loved one. And so to, to have that understanding, yeah, it's interesting that she must have had that. She'd been through it before because it's not the sort of thing that's easy to learn on the fly, is it? No. <laughs> yeah, it's bewildering. Um, and for my mum, her her father, my grandfather, was a, a severe alcoholic that was actually very violent. Mm. Uh, he was kind of like a tyrant in the family. There was, But, you know, it was interesting. I wrote this article um for the Metro recently and my mum uh, without my permission sort of posted it to the family thread and there's 12 brothers and sisters in the family and they really sort of it, it started the discussion of how much sort of they went through as kids but I think the, one of the things that they reflected on was they had 12 different you know kids to sort of like support each other and everything yeah. like that whereas you know if you're an only child, yeah, you are definitely all alone. But as I said before, my mum having gone through it uh, growing up and she's an extremely resilient woman, um, you know, I'm very grateful for her. Can I ask you um, if you had feelings in spite of, you know, how brilliant your mum was in communicating with you? As a, as a child, do you feel responsible or guilty when, when you see a parent behaving in that way? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think I did as much um, because I think I understood in an early enough age that it really is nothing to do with me. Um, you know, maybe, you know, how kids are so black and white. So maybe I just went completely the, well, that's not my problem kind of thing. Uh, which I guess, you know, is good. Um, yeah, so I managed to avoid that. But obviously in the groups that I run, that is a, a constant thread um, of feeling guilt and shame about um, not being able to help and not being enough for them to change. How old were you when your dad passed away? Forgive me if you've already told me that. Uh, uh, twenty-seven, and 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 what was your relationship with him like by that stage? So that's a it's a really important sort of thing that I want to talk about because, um, I I sort of like the situation evolved where um I moved away um to go to university when I was about eighteen. So I had less contact with him. Um, I started doing intense therapy, you know, once or twice a week for two years. Um, and I remember going to the therapist and saying, um, look, like I've, I'm actually like really, I've got all my shit together. Like look at all these things that I've achieved and blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm just here because I want to learn how to become a, a good therapist because I was training to be an addiction therapist when I was 18. Um, and so uh, within 10 minutes, he had me crying for f- floods of tears uh, for, for maybe 10 minutes. Um, and I had not cried for about three years before that. 
um, I learned to completely sort of shut off my emotions extremely. And I learned to put on a mask of like being useful and uh, liked by others, uh, which made me feel good enough. But then, you know, it obviously made me feel on the inside very alone and, um, yeah, isolated. And so how that relates to my dad is that um, I think that I had stopped caring Um like, well, that's what he's doing and that's fine. Um, and so it meant that I, I I, stopped being able to connect with him as much. Granted, he was very difficult to connect with because by the time I was about a teenager, his condition got so bad that he would not ask you any questions. He would not have the capacity to talk about, like to connect with anyone. He just, it was like a monologue for, for hours of what he was doing and his thoughts about things. And so where am I going with this? Um, so I think I was like, I'm, my job is to help you. Um, but I'm only going to love you. I'm only going to have a relationship with you if you stop drinking. Um, and what was underneath that was an extreme amount of feeling abandoned uh, feeling hurt, um, rejected, um, which I had not really processed. Mm. I, I processed it on an intellectual level that he's an alcoholic, he's not making a choice, but really I felt like I was um, abandoned by him. Uh, and I still feel feelings when I talk about it. Um, and so I just was like going to try and fix him. And obviously, subconsciously, I was trying to fix him by becoming an addiction therapist. That's mm. just a weird thing in and of itself. I wasn't actually, I I really consciously wasn't. I was just wanting to be a counsellor, and that was the only course that I was allowed to do. But obviously, subconsciously, I was looking to fix him. And then I would take him to AA meetings and, like, you know, after doing this course, because I thought, yeah, I've got the answer now. I'll send him to AA. I'll take him to the local counsellor. You know, and he just hated it. I remember a year or so after that whole thing and I stopped crying, um, he goes, I really didn't like you during that time because it felt like you were judging me. It felt like I was your client. Um, and, yeah, I really understand why he felt like that because I had contempt for him. It was like, mm. I don't respect you. Um, mm. And the thing about... The thing about that is that I had so much shame about myself as a human and there was a lot of things that I I felt self-hatred about because I was like him. Mm. Uh, and so because I, I, I hated him, I therefore hated myself. And so I needed to do a lot of work around accepting me as I am and the trait the, the the good things about my personality the, the really not so good things that I have to manage about my personality mm. but that allowed me to also um, love him for who he is and I actually he's not my biological dad I only found that out when I was 18 actually right um and so he always felt like if I found out that he wasn't my biological dad, that I would then well and truly, you know, cut him off because mm. you're not my dad anymore. Um, but really I came to a place of appreciating that he was, he stood, he, he stepped up to like take care of me and he loved me as his own. And so I just think that I was able to process a lot of my resentment and all that stuff to the point where I could actually love him unconditionally. I I still have boundaries. I'm not going to hang out with him when he's, you know, pissed on a bed, you know, and, and day five of a bender. But, like, I'm going to love him still from afar. I don't need to him to stop drinking in order for me to love him. And I was able to, you know, write, you know, write a big thing to him. I was able to 
um, every time I interacted with him, which wasn't wasn't often because I was living somewhere else and he was often drinking. But like the times that we did hang out, like it was different. It felt like love. And and yeah, so I'm I'm very glad that that kind of process happened um before he passed. Well, yeah, I mean healing must be something that you know, you speak to healing a relationship like that is is sounds extremely difficult. I think we've all into some small degree, maybe not to the same degree as you, have to come to terms with certain things our parents did in our childhood. And especially as we get older, we're all sort of you, your thoughts begin to turn to I need to kind of have healed this in some way that works for both of us before they pass away. Um yeah. and I guess that all of these experiences you've been through must lend you so much extra insight when you're when you're trying to help families of other addicts which of course is is the work you do now at the cabin or part of the work you do Mm. tell us a a bit Mm. about that about the work you do with the families of people who come for treatment yeah i'm just going to go a slight detour and that is that i think the work that i did towards loving my dad unconditionally meant that i would extend that unconditional uh love towards clients uh which hopefully has made me more effective in working with people with addictions um mm-hmm. because you know blah 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 but um but i think that's what i try to kind of role model towards um the family members uh, especially in our family program It's an eight-week family program that uh, is going from uh, helping them to connect to each other through processing some feelings that they're going through, Um, so building that group cohesion. And then uh, in the second week, you're looking at uh, addiction, what is it, and really understanding the neuroscience and, uh, you know, it's a, a primary chronic progressive brain illness and um, understanding all those things in order to be able to uh, see that this person has a disease, it is a legitimate thing. And if they can sort of hear all the characteristics of addiction and go, yeah, that's my loved one, then to a certain extent they're able to go, okay, well, if that's what they have, then maybe what he's telling us about the fact that they're not making a choice and blah, 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 and you didn't cause it and all of that, hopefully that has some legitimacy as well. Um, then it's about sort of looking at what denial is and, uh, you know, understanding their loved one's denial, but also understanding their own denial that they go through. Because when you're in a chronic situation where you're, you've got so much um, unpredictability, um, you then uh, have to, you know, you use certain coping mechanisms to do that, so mm. to, to deal with it. So you become a detective, you become very uh, paranoid and angry and manipulative, um, all these different ways to try to get control over a very uncontrollable situation. So if you can kind of understand the impact that that's having on you um understand the powerlessness that they have but also the powerlessness yeah the powerlessness that the addict has but also the powerlessness that Mm. the family member has then actually that's a good place to start in terms of okay so if i can't cure it and i can't sort of do much on my end what are the things that i can do and what are the boundaries I need to put in place in order to conserve my energy so I'm not wasting it in ways that are just kind of only going to make me feel even more hurt and more angry. Yeah. Um, so, is you know, is, is that the most common thing is that people try, I mean, you know, people might try to discourage, they might try to put up practical obstacles to the person drinking um yep. and they might also try to make ultimatums to people as well um yep. people often assume if you're a recovering addict from my personal experience they assume that 
they very often assume that say like my wife gave me an ultimatum and it's almost what they want i I find that's what people want to hear in a way especially people who might be worried about their own drinking so so you only gave out because and i say no that i was i wasn't actually ever given an ultimatum i wasn't told Mm -hmm. i mean i was i was she was very clear with me that she was very worried and upset about my drinking but she never said and and I'm pretty sure that if she had said that, it wouldn't have made a difference. It might have even made me worse because I would have felt very angry yes. and I was yeah. there was a paranoia playing out in my head where I thought that everyone, particularly her, was trying to control me and therefore I saw myself as a victim. And so, you know, mm-hmm. ultimatums would have actually played into that narrative. Not that I'm saying anyone who makes those ultimatums to loved ones is wrong because you can see why why you would do it. But I guess those appear to me, from my perspective, to be some of the, the main things that, that people feel in the early stages before they've got to grips with what's going on. Is that your experience and, and what do you tell them? Yeah, very much so. Uh, so that's completely on point. Um, so when it comes to, so we spend a couple of sessions on boundaries specifically and it's it's kind of hard for them to do uh, what I'm asking them to do. And actually, often it takes a couple of cycles, even three, four, five cycles of the family program to really kind of grasp the boundaries in a, in a more, I don't know, proper way. Because boundaries are supposed to be for you. You need to be aware of what it is that you need in order to be able to live a uh satisfying, happy, healthy, safe existence. And you therefore naturally, because the addict is is often encroaching on your boundaries, you have to then start to put boundaries in place that then will probably, you know, uh, be making that other person's life a bit bit, uh, uncomfortable Um, because, you know, I... They, they won't necessarily have the emotional support as much as they want or need because the person is going, well, actually, I don't have that energy. I'm, I'm, I can give you five minutes, but I can't give you, you know, the whole evening to talk about your feelings and all your crazy thoughts. So when you are able to put boundaries in place over time that are in line with you, then you're less likely to be doing it to try to manipulate the other person, to try to convince them and, you know, uh, to change because actually you are powerless to them deciding to change a lot of the time. It really is up to them. Mm-hmm. Obvi- but again, obviously when they put boundaries in place, it does have a positive effect, especially if they're able to make it consistent because if they're just doing it because they're emotional, uh, but then actually when it comes down to it, they don't follow through with those ultimatums, then, you know, God, you're just going to lose um, a lot of, I don't know what the word is, but uh, the addict will usually take advantage of that because they know that that's not the end of the road. I've got I've got more rope. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. um Another thing that I wanted to ask you about is the degree to which we can talk a different sort of denial where um, uh, families often, uh, relatives will not, you know, people don't like the word addict or alcoholic um, because there's shame associated with it if you've got a relative who's an, an alcoholic. And also it seems like something that's too much of a mountain to climb. So very often, yes. and and also... Some alcoholics, a lot of alcoholics, and in this case of me, are very kind of careful and secretive. So sometimes their relatives don't see the full extent of their problem. So to what extent do you see people um, when you treat whole families, like members of that family, who kind of take the position of, oh, come on, he just, the thing is, he likes a drink, let's say, right? Yeah, he likes a drink, but for God's sake, he just needs to, He's not. it's not like he's an alcoholic, he just needs to rein it in right because mm, there are yeah. lots of people like that or very often you might have a member in your family who's like that and they just they drank too much around then they reined it in because perhaps it what didn't have the mm. full characteristics of addiction i found that yeah. a lot of people not just with myself but also with other people that i've helped 
you know, relatives will very often say the thing is you can't talk about it in terms of addiction because it's not. He's just a bit of a pisshead and he needs to knock it on the head, for goodness sake. Yeah. How common is yeah. that and how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, often there are some of those attitudes that are present. Um, however, again, that's where the education comes in. It's my job to, and it's a bit like, you know, when I'm doing an assessment with a client like mm. who's got uh, um, symptoms of addiction, I'm trying to be able to listen to their story, uh, but then I'm framing it in terms of what I understand addiction to be. And when it marries up pretty perfectly, it's kind of like, well, mm. that's what you got. And they usually can accept it uh, once you're able to sort of uh, – position it properly when mm. when you can speak the language that they're speaking and then obviously if i've got this thing that i haven't been able to control because i have this addiction then i'm going to need to get help and what are the things that i need to do to do that and then you kind of give them the options and then they kind of go from there so that's how i work with a client but then when it comes to the family um you know it's kind of similar um but again, it can be tricky to work with family members around it too. I'm just trying to think why. But um, family members are just tricky to work with generally. Um, but it's just about giving them the information and then they're able to go, ah, yes, okay, that that is what I'm seeing. That's how it makes me feel. That's And, and then once you frame it in terms of what it is, which is addiction, then basically it's about giving them the information about what it is that you can do to address this problem. And often the things that you need to do to address the problem are counterintuitive to what they usually feel like would help. Um, so that's another little tidbit. Do you mind, it's a big question and I feel bad putting you on a spot, but do you mind explaining to us, you're summarizing to us what you think, an addict is and you know when you're trying to explain to someone like you say well look these are the characteristics of an addict yeah. because of course you know a lot of people think unless you are on a park bench guzzling whiskey your life is in tatters um and you're, you're effectively like a, a vagrant who is constantly inebriated then you are not you're someone who likes to drink is maybe drinking too much you're not yeah. an addict that's a, a common kind of misconception. How do you address that? How do you characterize an addict? So um, generally uh, I would just out the gate, like, so I'd listen to the story and then I would go. So I have to kind of be convinced as well that I think that the yeah. ifs, because if I don't think that they are, then maybe I might position it differently. Um, Cause I'm not going to tell them they have an addiction when I actually don't think that they do. Mm. If I do think that they do, because, you know, I'm looking at the DSM-4, DSM-5 criteria for um, alcohol use disorder, I'm looking at uh, powerlessness and unmanageability. Um, once I get enough of that, then I'm ready to kind of... <laughs> can you give, us, a, can you give us, then, us some examples of that, though? Because, you know, the specifics you're looking out for, only because I know that, you know, yeah. there'll be people listening who, who are trying to work out whether they themselves have an issue or whether the, the, their their loved yeah. ones do. Hey, on the spot. Uh, so uh, the drinking is uh, increasing in terms of amounts uh, or the amount that you usually would drink is not really doing it. Uh, you're not getting intoxicated the same way. Uh, you're experiencing withdrawal symptoms and it might not necessarily be physical withdrawal symptoms, but it can also be psychological and emotional withdrawal symptoms like irritability and anxiety, depression. Um, so a lot of those sort of withdrawal symptoms, then um, the kind of um, the impact that it's having on family relationships, uh, the types of things that their family are talking about, uh, their ability to function at work is impaired. Um, generally, there's just a lack of control. A, a, a lot of the people that I see, there's they don't have an off switch. 
So uh, they're not mm. able to kind of stick to a level that keeps them out of trouble. Mm. So they'll, you know, maybe not even constantly, but maybe once a month, once every couple of months. But it actually happens fairly routinely, even if it's not every week or every time they drink. Mm. But eventually they they completely write themselves off and then they're, you know, like breaking their arms or they're getting into massive argument with their partner and so it's the binge drinking that can uh, be a problem and can have a lack of control uh, as part of how it is. And also the problems are getting worse and worse and worse. There's attempts to try to change, but then they're not actually be able to, they're not able to sustain those changes. Yeah. And there's also elements of denial. There's kind of like it's not that bad. Um, people are making a big deal out of it. Um, I drink because, you know, I work hard and blah, blah, blah. And so usually, like, people will find ways of avoiding that truth uh, because they're sort of convincing themselves that actually, you know, it's not that bad. Um, people, one one of the, the best things that I ever heard someone say when I was first in recovery is just like, you know, showing people love and kindness is is the most powerful thing you can do for an addict and i have repeated that to other people who've got loved ones who they're who they're really concerned about but i'm concerned it makes sense to me but i'm not a, an expert or a professional like you i know what it means and i know how powerful it can be because my biggest fear was that people would judge me that people disliked mm. me hated me and like the whole world was against me because I felt well you mm. know I, I've lost control here and this is all born so I'm either gonna I'm just gonna have to deny it and deny it and deny it I can't come clean because if I do that like uh, all of the problems I have in my life will be made even worse because of the judgments I'll receive or the rejections or whatever but the truth is mm. I was shown, I was lucky enough to be shown love and kindness by some key people. And when I was shown that it gave me the incentive and the will to to do the work I needed to get better. So that's how I mm. understand it. But when I say it to other yeah. people, when they ask me, I feel like I can sound trite, right? It like it, It's hard for people to think. And they think, well, what difference is that going to make? It just makes people feel like oh I can carry on because your love is so unconditional and, and all the rest of it um mm-hmm. do, do, you know how how do you sort of square that circle because I, I know what it what it means but in in your role helping families how do you square that circle because that I'm assuming that must cause confusion with some people yeah um let me see if I can uh put it um so a big part of uh, in the group, there is a – the fact is, is that you love your loved ones so much that you're willing to go to a program like this to try to help them. Mm. And uh, in no way do we want to minimize their love for their loved one. Um, actually, that love for their loved one is the, is the lifeline that the – um, person with addiction needs uh, and like the loved one, the love that they have for their loved one is what is keeping them going as well. So mm. um, I think being able to, cause there's a lot of shame for why haven't you left them, you know, why yeah. are you wasting your time on this? And so if you can actually like remove the, or reduce the shame because you're with a whole bunch of other people who are also choosing to stay then it means that my love can actually be acceptable and okay. So then that kind of keeps the embers burning, despite mm. the fact that, you know, the, the addict is doing so many things that are really sort of not good. Um, and then that's when the boundaries come in for me, because I set boundaries because I want to maintain a relationship with you, because if I don't set these boundaries for myself, then I'm going to get completely fucking resentful and I'm going to get bitter and twisted and I'm mm-hmm. going to be sick of you. And then I'm going to let, and I'm going to hate you. <laughs> I'm going to judge the shit out of you and it's not going to help you and it's not mm-hmm. helping me. 
And so if you can set boundaries in a way that keeps the embers of your love burning, then, you know, you're more likely to be able to maintain a relationship with that person until they're ready. But obviously the boundaries will also have a positive effect as well. But hopefully if you're able to explain those boundaries in a way that comes from a loving place rather than just a, you know, like you can't be trusted or you're Mm. fucking useless or anything like that. Mm. That is really interesting and makes so much sense to me. I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, You know, in terms of connecting with other people, like you say, so you, you'll be bringing people together in groups, different relatives who can who can speak to one another. Just interested, you know, how long it took you in your life with your experiences to meet other people who'd been through similar things and, and what a difference that made to you? I, I don't think that I necessarily have many people that I, who have had similar experiences to me, but I think that even, you know, and it sounds a bit shit, but like doing the family programme, I've actually found it very therapeutic for myself. I, um, when I am before the group, I'm looking forward to seeing people. And, you know, obviously I need to be sharing my story in order for me to be able to get, be getting my needs met. And I do do that with, you know, different people and different friendships at times when it's relevant. But I don't necessarily do super amount of self-disclosure in the group because I want to have that space for the group but there's something about just people sharing similar experiences and like I think it has helped me as well just sort of being in this field and and doing these sort of groups and connecting with them um just lastly I just want to ask you about you know if someone's listening who is who is struggling with uh, you know a loved one maybe a spouse or maybe a child who's just you know basically not responding and you know they feel they feel helpless you know what what, what's the message what's the one thing that you might that you can do for your for yourself as much as for them Mm -hmm. are you going to cut my long pause um Because I'm like, okay, self-care would be good, but then if you're constantly having to deal with behaviours that trigger a lot of anxiety and stress, then, you know, then all the self-care in the world isn't going to really sort of do it. So um, I think talk to people, um, talk to somebody. Um, I know that it feels very isolating where you are and if you feel like if you were to tell people, then... They wouldn't know what to say. And probably they won't know what to say either. But maybe you just say, look, I'm going through a lot right now. Uh, I just need you to listen. I don't need your advice. And just tell them. And you might be surprised at, at the fact that people might might be good. It might be good talking to people about it. Because that connection with others, feeling like you're not alone, um, there's something about it that's helpful that gives you strength and blah 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 um i really appreciate your time today jordan uh i'm sorry that i've put you on the spot mm. with with some big questions but i mean for what it's That's worth good. for what it's worth i think the things that you shared have been really powerful and very useful they're really useful to me a lot of what you said and and i hope to to a lot of people listening as well and i'm really grateful that you know you you've been willing to share your own personal experiences uh, as well um so thanks ever so much where can people find out more about the work you do um yeah so i work for the cabin uh it's a rehab in thailand but we do uh addiction treatment and working with families online everywhere in the world i'm based in london so um you know you can find me there i'm online um but let me just make sure that i know the right uh um email address sorry well no, i'll make right, sure that i put so, it in the show in all the show notes as well so don't right. so don't worry about that i'll yeah. make sure that Thank the you. website and all the contact details are uh, are in the show notes but um listen John patterson yeah, uh you're you're an inspiration i've learned a huge amount and thank you so much for your time today no thank you sam it was great cheers that was jordan patterson 
a real privilege to hear his story. I'm so grateful that he was willing to share it so honestly. You can Google the cabin at Chiang Mai to find out more. And if you're a relative of an addict and would like to get free support from people in the same boat as you, I can recommend you look up alanonuk.org.uk or just Google Al Anon UK, which I know many people have found massively helpful. That's it for this week, gang. Thanks as always for tuning in and please subscribe if you don't already at samdelaney.substack.com. Until next time, be lucky and don't let the dickheads get you down. Music.